the Japanese QW satellite is part of the constellation, and the French uh, Parasol satellite flies very close to that constellation, and actually used to be uh, part of it. So that's when we'll get the data that I'll be showing you um, in, this, uh, uh, in, in, in this narration. The uh, next chart shows, um, isn't focused on the poles, but it shows uh, the temperature anomalies for a period of over 100 years. So most of that obviously was surface-based measurements. We didn't have satellite observations back then. Um, and the uh, incident anomalies, so this is relative to sort of what you would expect to find in, in that area, in that place. And blue is colder than normal, oranges and red are warmer than normal. And you can see by the time you get up to the present, things are a lot warmer, but especially um, the, 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 the Arctic in particular is an area that's uh, more, much more appreciably than the rest of the planet. Uh, so when we start looking at changes at the poles, uh, you can see that we've got good reasons to look there uh, because that's where the Earth seems to be uh, warming most rapidly and there's a lot of things that are, uh, are going on there. We um, will focus significantly but not exclusively on ice because uh, that tends to be what you think of at the poles. Uh, but at NASA we like to uh, use it so the, the uh, approach that we'll call Earth System Science and really look at all the Earth, uh, the components of the Earth and how they interact with each other and, and then to really be able to, to build up the understanding of, of how different pieces of, uh, interact with each other, uh, that understanding and being able to uh, quantitatively test hypotheses that you know, using models based on observations gives us increased confidence in the way that we look at the future. And as you said, the polls are an area where there's a lot going on. And of course, from the point of view of uh, uh, satellite observations, they're really a wonderful way to look at the poles because the, the, the polar regions otherwise can be very, very difficult uh, to be able to get uh, sort of comprehensive and regular observations for things like um, ice sheet thickness or ice sheet mass or uh, sea ice distributions. Uh, but because the satellites are over the poles so often, um, it's, it's a good thing for the satellites to be able to do. Next uh, shows examples of uh, some things in, in the high latitudes. This is the Columbia Glacier in Alaska, and what it does is over a period of time, uh, it gives you a sense of, uh, uh, of how the glacier is receding. Uh, we tend to use this, a lot of the stuff with the land imaging satellites from the Landsat um, uh, series, but what you can see is it's got the date in the lower right hand corner there, which I, I'm, I'm really good at standing in front of the dates, so I, I try to make sure that I don't actually block them. Um, but then you can see over a period of time um, how the ice has receded, and again it's the kind of thing that if you uh, uh, the, the, the uh, ability of the satellites to comprehensively image an area and to be able to frequently revisit it gives you uh, uh, the ability to do something that would be very difficult to do without them. Uh, next. Uh, we'll zero in on one of the uh, uh, most interesting and, and complex and rapidly changing areas. This has to do with the uh, the extent of sea ice in the Arctic at the September minimum. So because over the course of the summer, as the ice melts, um, you look at what you end up with when you get to the ice to the minimum. This is built with uh, 35 years of passive microwave data. You can see for a while it's a little bit of a decline, but a lot of interannual variability. And it seems like maybe it's declining a little bit uh, faster. Um, but 2007, you had a big drop, then some recovery. In 2012, you had a big drop. Uh, and then some recovery. And if you look, um, once it starts repeating itself, the imagery that will show where sort of the, the ice water line was at the end of the, the, at this minimum time in September, and you'll see by the time that you get towards the end of it, areas that have ice all the way up to the coastlines um, are, are starting to look ice free. Um, it's certainly not quite the, the Northwest Passage, so to speak, uh, but that, you know, when you start thinking about the possibilities of uh, having the Northwest Passage and uh, being able to engage in shipping at, at times and places that in the past uh, you wouldn't have been able to do, um, it, it's a, a bit of a different world up there and there's some opportunities and, and challenges that, that will come from that. Um, one of the things that you can see is the, um, spatially the pattern is pretty complex and it, it, it's certainly not a monotonic curve. Um, 
you're, you're, there's a lot of interannual variability that's superimposed on these uh, changes, and, and we want to want to be able to understand. Say, why did you have that big drop in 2007? Why did you have that big drop in 2012? Uh, and you know, ideally, to be able to say more than just, well, interannual variability—that's what it, what it does. Um, but, but we need to be able to, to look at that. Um, next is uh, something else that we've done to zoom in on. This zooms in on, on Greenland for about 10 years using the GRACE satellites. Those are a US-German collaboration where it uses the difference uh, in distance between the two satellites uh, to provide information about the uh, variation in the gravity field, which can be related to the mass of the underlying land area. So. Um, uh, what you get in this 10 years is you get this downward trend, a pretty consistent trend of decreasing mass. You get some sense of where it is. It's losing mass around the edges. It's actually gaining a little bit of mass uh, in the central part of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, island there. Uh, but what you're getting is, again, the kind of thing that's very hard to contemplate. How you can even begin to address something like this without the ability of satellites to do that. And it's, it's sort of like you're taking Greenland and weighing it. Uh, because what you're getting is a change in mass. Uh, figure the continent itself doesn't change. Um, but um, so now we see that the action, so to speak, is at the uh, tends to be at the edges, at the ocean ice interface. So that becomes a very uh, interesting area of science right now. We've got a airborne issue point field campaign that's been addressing it for uh, called OMG. It's a multi-year uh, campaign that just got started. It stands for Oceans Melted Greenland. Um, because you really want to try to look at what is, what's happening. That can give you some sense as to you know, how fast the changes may come in the future, which is important to know. Next. Uh, shows a uh, picture of the glaciers in the southern hemisphere. So this is Argentina. It's the Upsway Glacier, and it shows a couple of different times. 1986, 2001, 2014, and you can see the retreat of the glacier uh, over that time period. Um, one, one of the nice things about the, uh, the satellite observations is their ability to, to apply the same technique and get relatively consistent data anywhere in the world. Um, and, and this idea that to a good approximation, the data in one part of the world are just as good as the data in any other part of the world. That's really something that, that as, as a species, we haven't had that capability uh, really until the satellite era for so long. You know, we would know about where we were, the areas where we would be, where we would have the uh, the, the infrastructure and the, uh, the trained personnel to be able to make the quantitative measurements that, that we need. But with the satellites, you know, I can show you something in, in Argentina the same way I showed you something in Alaska, in the same way that I can show you uh, some other places. Um, next. Uh, so we, we use airplanes sometimes uh, to help fill in the gap between the, the ISAT satellite that we had to measure ice sheet thickness and the next uh, ISAT uh, 2 that's going to launch in 2018. We've been doing uh, airborne uh, field campaign called Operation Ice Bridge, where we fly uh, once a year in the Arctic, once a year in the uh, Antarctic. A couple of times we've been able to do an extra campaign in the Arctic. Um, and, uh, but this is the Pine Island Glacier um, in the Antarctic, and it's uh, sort of uh, the visualization of the uh, data that's been taken from the, uh, uh, the aircraft, where we have radar, we have LIDARs, and some other kinds of things that we'll have. But we get uh, this way to get a sense as to what it actually looks like um, there. So it's a, it's a complementary view to what one can do with the satellites, but you can get sort of a more detailed sense of, of how things look, and that builds up your knowledge base and your intuition. Next. Um, so now we can look at ice flows in Antarctica. We may not think of ice as something that flows, but it moves. Um, and this is work that a number of scientists have done, uh, so you can infer information about ice sheet velocity. This doesn't come from our satellite data. It's a based on radar data, and we have not had that kind of radar um, satellites, so a lot of that comes from their uh, data from their international partners, but the scientists, being uh, big scientists, will figure out how to use whatever data they can get, and once the data are out there and, and, and uh, uh, made available and shared, we'll be able to look at things and, and really get some sense as to how the ice is flowing, and, and again, because 
so the, the, the action in the melting will take place where the ice hits the water, and if the ice is flowing uh, relatively more rapidly, then that means that there's always going to be more ice to melt, as opposed to if the ice is uh, traveling slowly. So, so that's some of the kinds of things that people can do with um, uh, the, the, the radar uh, data set there that's really come from our international partners. Um, next is uh, some things that we have been looking at in the Antarctica. This uses the, the GRACE satellites again. So this is a complement to the data um, uh, that I showed for Greenland. Um, the GRACE launched in 2004. So this one will scroll through relatively slowly. Again, the, the reds are areas where we, we're losing mass. The blues are areas where we're gaining it. See, it's this West Antarctica area that's losing. And it's a fairly steady uh, uh, downward push, but it's uh, certainly not at a constant rate. You see, a uh, you know, big drop here. Um, part of it's very very good, they have a big drop there. Um, and uh, uh, again, the fact that you can actually, in this case, zoom in and, and, and look back again and, and sort of focus in on West Antarctica. And, um, so this is it's another example of really the, the ability to look at these. Very difficult to observe parts of the world, but in a very rigorous way to be able to get a sense of, uh, of what's going on there. Next. Uh, this you know, maybe isn't quite the poles, but it's, uh, it's getting close. And it's important, I think, to begin to make the connection about what's going on at the poles and what's going on at the rest of the uh, um, the, the, the rest of the Earth, because the connections are not um, certainly not unexpected. So this is data from the, uh, one of the more recently launched satellites that we have, the SMAP, so moisture active passive that was launched at the end of January, and it, 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 the primary thing that it would do is soil sort of moisture, but it could also provide information about freeze-thaw status. So because it's in the polar orbit, you could look down at the poles. Now in the case of the Arctic, there's um, a lot of ocean in the Arctic, so um, uh, you know, that's not the, what this free star thing is looking for, it's really looking for the soil. But just over a period of less than two weeks, um, you can see a big difference between the amount of territory that's frozen and the amount of uh, uh, territory that's, that's thawed. There's a lot more thawed territory um, in high, uh, sort of approaching uh, high latitudes. Uh, so you can begin to look at it. Uh, Central and Northern Canada, working way towards Alaska, working way into uh, to Russia, so you get to the land areas that are uh, approaching the Arctic. And, and, uh, so this is a data set that we've got uh, a few months of, and uh, you know, uh, expectations. We hope that we'll be able to um, look, look at some of these things in the uh, future. So that's a new kind of observation that scientists will be working on. We have, I think. Uh, couple of months, uh, at least right now, of that. Next is, um, uh, I, I said it wouldn't all be about ice, so uh, I thought I'd, I'd say something about um, what's, what's above the ice. I'm uh, talking about the Antarctic ozone hole. Um, this uh, shows uh, some data from uh, the uh, ultraviolet-based techniques that have been used with the total ozone magnet spectrometers and successor instruments like the um, ozone monitoring instrument that flies above the Aurora spacecraft. We've used a variety of satellites, uh, US and non-US, to characterize the ozone hole, we're trying to get the October minimum, because that's the time that we get the, the minimum. And uh, you've got a, a fairly consistent picture. Um, so some of the early stuff is based on ground-based observations, because we didn't have the satellites then. Uh, so that the, the real prime satellite period started in um, 78, 79, had a few satellites and uh, observations early 70s. Um, 